so I brought, um, I forged these, it was just one heat, threw it under the power hammer. Um, and they were probably forged at a, uh, a hearty yellow heat, I would say. So, just trying to bring them up, or this one anyway, bring it up uh, to a normalizing heat uh, before I quench it. And trying to get it fairly even in color. It's a little hot, to be truthful. Um, controlling your heat in a gas forge is a little tricky. Uh, if you, this one has a problem trying to stay choked down well enough. Um, if I choke it too much more, it starts popping. So it's just one of those things that's a little annoying. Uh, but gas forges, if you you know if you can get a probe in there uh, with a thermocouple or a pyrometer, you can actually really control that heat well and uh, get very favourable heat treat results. Uh, you know, I always thought. I suppose I should put a little bit more heat in there. Uh, I always thought that um, I could do really well in. A forge and produce very good heat treats and did so for years and about what do you say 10 years ago something like that I got a, uh, a heat treat up an electric heat treat and I will say that the quality of the heat treat is far better and you know I say that kind of very loosely because of those folks who are using say uh, salt pots and things like that where they're really really controlling their temperatures they're probably getting even better results than, um, than I am in a convective style um, heat treats of them. So you know obviously there's always that eternal refining of how good can you get that heat treat um, and also I kind of feel that there's, gonna, there's got to be a point where basically the benefits have outweighed the effort. So, you know, it's like, okay, I'm now going into salt pots and I'm being able to control it to, you know, 0.5 of a degree and I'm doing a conductive um, heat treat rather than a convective, because, um, you know, the, this is just kind of an ambient environment that's throwing the heat into it. So you kind of get going to get into that balance of for that extra half point, that extra one point, is it beneficial for what you're doing? And that's really down to you to decide on that. Um, you know, in classic scientific um, approach, some people will do just purely because you can do. Um, you know, there's absolutely I want a beer that glows in the dark and uh, repels cat hairs so awesome I you know somebody develops that um, likewise can I get O1 or you know a similar alloy tool steel to be in the mid 70s Rockwell C sure I'm sure somebody's gonna be able to do it or has already done it already um, but in so doing, you've kind of put it out into another realm where average Joe can't even sharpen their knife any longer. So that's something to think about is, sure, you can do these things and you can make something exceptionally hard, but then you've basically made it impossible for people to use. So there's another issue. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting quantum. You know, and what we're arguing about on hardness now is something that's unheard of a hundred years ago. You know, we're getting hardnesses that, you know, sure we could get mid 60s with a 10 series, you know, like 1095. You could get mid 60s if you really, really pushed it. You could make a razor blade out of it. But now we're talking 70s plots. Which is nuts. Anyway, that's a little side rant. So now I've got a single uh, normalized cycle on this. So uh, literally all I did is I fed it through the power hammer, threw it 
throw it on the table down there with those other two and the one that I've busted up. And now I'm going to try and get as even a heat as I can on this and do a full quench in oil. I'll then temper it from one end. So one end over here will be in the gray range and the other end will be in the silver range and then we'll just break it again and see those results. And also I would like to use the files to show the hardness variances from one end to the other. Uh, because it's surprising how small those adjustments are. Um, a relative, you know, temperature, we're looking at the difference between 600 degrees and 200 degrees. And uh, the hardness differences are less than 10 points on the rock glass season. Often. environment to get a nice even heat that should do it a little warmer than um, my true 1600 or what was it oh. uh, <laughs> damn it for 01 i think it's actually 1525 is my ideal temperature i have no idea where that is i'm gonna be fishing for a while here oh what's that there we go what's that so I didn't get my best agitation in the oil <laughs> uh, Can I just make a statement? Uh, if you do what Mark just did and drop a freshly heat treated thing into the bottom of the oil, don't go fishing for it with your hand. <laughs> I know that seems obvious, but it isn't always. Mm -hmm. And I have seen people burn themselves that way. Yes. Yeah, I've missed out on that one. It was... Yeah, let's not talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's an off-screen conversation. <laughs> was it one of our dear friends? It was. Awesome. Well done. Alright. So that's brought that down pretty well. nice to yourself, wipe the excess oil off your tongs because later on when that has shellacked and you basically have jelly, <laughs> Jess's face is priceless there, uh, you have jelly on the reins of your tongs and you grab a hold of it and go, what the hell was that? And then you get it hot and it starts dribbling down onto you. God. That doesn't bother me as much as sometimes when I'm forging. And if I'm especially hungry and then I grab a pair of tongs that has canola oil on it and I get them hot and then it starts smelling like bad... Cheap Chinese. <laughs> yeah, like bad fast food. And you're like, mmm, I'm, <laughs> I'm hungry. like, mm, I want some french fries. <laughs> it's like, ah, that beautiful smell of stale canola oil and engine oil mixed yeah. together. <laughs> awesome. It's sort of like following one of those uh, old Volvos down the highway that's been converted to a run on french fry oil. I don't think I've ever smelled one. Oh, of those. you haven't? Uh -uh. Oh, that's an aroma. Okay, so hopefully this one's cooled down all the way. I, as I said, 01 is uh, rather tricky because if you do cool it off too quickly, um, it will split. And I've done it myself. I've actually, you know, taken a punch of something like this, finished forging it, done, done my heat treat. Well, actually, I don't even do a heat treat on these. I just let them come down. And uh, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. And I'll throw it in a bucket of water to cool off the rest of the way, even though it was probably only about 200 degrees. And the sucker will crack from tip to tail. Um, so, yeah, just don't even bother. I'm going to uh, give this a little bit of brightening nice and tight. You can hear that hardness in it. And I'm going to give it a wee grind, get some bright spots on it. Also, look at that spark pack. Uh, this is 012. It's got this beautiful 
beautiful day. Uh, very, uh, very tight and modular. Doesn't have the big sparkles of uh, the 10 series. Here. I believe it's the tungsten. because it just cuts so much better. This one's a fairly warm one. I said earlier, I think it's an 80. But I like to get the grain going this way rather than horizontal. Um, it's unlikely that those horizontal grind lines will cause weak spots, but and can we just say for those who might be watching this and saying, hey, he said not to put it in water for like 24 hours. If it were a tool that you were using. Yeah, certainly with but, 01, it's got to come down to room temperature for sure. Yeah. Um, so. But we're going to smash this to death. Exactly. <laughs> That's kind of what I was trying to say is this is just, you know, for a video. But if that were something that you had just forged a tool or something like that, then you would be a little more careful. You got a good view on those colors? Um, it's I a don't. little dark. You can do this with a butane torch or whatever. Wave it over the fire, see a little bit of brown or kind of off color like straw starting to appear. What I'd like is light straw to be about here and down that end to be a nice gray. Yeah, it's starting to come up now. You can really see it it's starting to travel. Try and get that distance a little further away so I get more elongation in the heat. We'll separate a little bit. Like this is kind of interesting. Um, you know, we talk about for knife making and, and a lot of uh, tool smithing, especially if you're in the oven. Um, I'll do my heat treat or my temple cycles will be very, very long, so like uh, two hours plus for a temper, and often I'll do multiple cycles. Uh, so you know, kind of almost doing like these flash tempers, as I, I suppose it's almost referred. Um, but interestingly, you know, despite everything that I know over in the heat treat oven land, um, and then over to this, it does do a thing, even though it seems to be for a relatively short period of time. And the color oxide, so the, the, the rainbow colors, as it were, that we got on the steel, they're oxide formations created by the temperature. So yeah. Is this gonna be hay for me? Not the best batch of colours I've ever had. Um this is a funny one. I, I had a um, 
somebody was doing a body drawn temper, I think it was in a class, somebody was doing a body drawn temper on, on a tool that they had forged. And they couldn't see the colors, so they they went and they scrubbed it again <laughs> with some sandpaper. Um, which is fine, but just realize if you do that, you're going to take all the oxides off. Yeah, and you, you're going to get so, a false read at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might be about as good as I It's not as pretty as I was hoping for. It looks like I've got a little bit of a grease stain there, which deformed my blues. Uh, but I do have light blue gray over here and kind of a purplish here. It's a little ambiguous in this zone, and then I've got some bronzes and then into the light straw up into that area. Let's um, cool it off. This I can cool in water. This is something that people have problems sometimes with. Uh, after tempering, you can cool in water, because it's a low temperature thing. Colors are still there pretty well. And let's do some fire tests. So down in that lower portion, I'm hoping to be in the 50s-ish. So try that one, I believe that's 50. Not even touching it, so there's a thing. So 55. Mm, maybe. Just a wee bit. And obviously up here, absolutely diddly. 60. Cutting down here, trying that mid portion. Mm, kind of sort of cutting. Comparative to that one, um, far less, and then up here, absolutely nothing, and then 65, Let's see, absolutely biting there, biting-ish there, it's doing the midpoint there, a little less, and out here, virtually nothing, so there is, there is a little gradation of that hardness as you come up through the body, okay? Um, I could do a secondary pass on it as well to kind of get that to convert better all the way through. I'm not going to. What I would like to try though is uh, breaking it. So I'd like to try breaking it here in the silver area where it didn't essentially get any temper at all. And then maybe down in the brown, maybe into the blue, see if things fail. Um, so hopefully this doesn't get too exciting. So first off in the non-tempered zone. That got pretty uh, exciting. Have a look at that grain structure. Pretty tight. And that was just from the one cycle. But also remember, this only had one heat in the fire, uh, up to yellow. Gonna move into the bronze area, see how this goes. Baloo. Really hound. Come on out of the way, buddy. Pooper. Come on. Okay, that's a rather fan. Um, into the richer blue area here. I broke fairly far back. Maybe I've got a fault in my temper at that point. Give it a couple more in this blue zone. And. Oh, they've gone out, buds. All the way. <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. It looks for your own safety. Can't wear proper PPE. No idea where that went. <laughs> but finally got that to fail in the blue zone here. And again, very, very fine grain structure. So just from that, I'm gonna gather up the pieces at the top. But just from that, you'll see, uh, hopefully when we come back and look at video, you'll see how much effort uh, 
each piece took to get to fail. So that silver portion here failed pretty easily. This one was a little bit more tough and then into the blue was really quite tough. Uh, so hopefully that kind of helps explain a little bit about your hardness variances and your toughness trade-off with the temper cycles. And you know, that's not hugely scientific, but you could go ahead and do like drop brake tests and things like that, where you brace a piece between two points and drop a weight onto it and see what the failure is or what the deformation is. So anyway, um, so the, the long and short of this is, right, if you're tempering a tool, if you're gonna be bashing 10 bells out of it, probably not the best thing to do is have it in the silver range, right? Um, probably better to be more in your blue range. If it's something that is needs some toughness, so maybe a small knife, probably into that bronzy brown area would be pretty good, uh, be pretty tough, but still maintaining over 60 Rockwell C, which is pretty solid. Um, also, you can do combination tempers, as this piece was. So you might have heard of things like blue backing uh, on big knives or swords, where you heat the spine, you do a full quench, so it's not a differential quench, uh, which is also a thing, which is basically what we did on the, uh, on the chisel. But instead of having a differential and quench, you quench the whole thing uniformly, get a uniform hardness, you then have a primary temper, which might be to 350 degrees, whatever you desire, for that cutting edge, and then come in and sweat the spine to bring that to blue, whilst keeping your cutting edge cool in a sand, wet sand bath or something like that. And that way you'll have that variance between the blue spring-like tough spine, but still have that very hardness of the cutting edge which, you know, it's kind of a desirable balance between the two, so you can abuse it, and the hard cutting edge is supported with a softer spring-like resilient spine. Anyway, um, that's kind of heat treating in a nutshell. Make sure you do your normalizing annealing. Harden it appropriately for its intended outcome um, and the actual material that it is so don't go and water quench something that is absolutely an air hardening steel and then be surprised because it fails um, that's ridiculous um, tweak your quench mediums trying to find what is appropriate for your personal use and then find a temper that works well for you um, and understand that the temper that you use on a straight edge razor is not the temper that you're going to use on a five foot long sword uh, because they're just very, very different creatures. One has more leverage to it, one needs to have a finer edge and more of a keen edge. Um, what else? Can you think of anything, Jess? Probably five minutes after I yeah. turn the video off but um, not right this moment. Quench mediums. I feel like there was something in that. Oh, there's a weird one here about um, heating up your quench oil. And it's kind of, a, it's an interesting idea. Heat up your quench oil to 120 degrees, I think is what I've generally heard. And then quench your blades or whatever it might be, always in oil that is 120 degrees. Well, from my understanding, certain um, polymers, so things, uh, I believe it's the uh, Parks 50 is one of them, uh, when they get up to about 120 degrees, they start becoming a little unstable in their quench, so they're not gonna give you as good a result in the quench. But also, if you live in somewhere like Wyoming, where in the winter time you're getting down to like 10 degrees or below, and in the summertime you're up in the hundreds, um, you've got a really huge variant in your 
temperatures on your quench material, uh, quench medium. So you know you've got your bucket of oil in the workshop, and in the summertime it's 100 degrees, and in the winter time it's well below freezing. That is a huge variance, and you want to create consistency. So you know we're fortunate we're in Georgia. Even in the winter time, you know, it's middle of January. And we have a blistering temperature of 58 degrees in the shop. And in the summertime, it's gonna probably get to 85 in the shop. Not a big difference in, uh, in temperature change. But if you are in that environment where it is very variable, make sure that you find a consistency for your quench. Uh, and also make sure you understand your quench medium to make sure that it itself doesn't start degrading or not functioning properly over a certain temperature or under a certain temperature. Uh, likewise, if you are plate quenching, so you're, you're using a, uh, an air, a, a steel that you're quenching as an air hardening steel between plates, think about it. If your plate isn't clean, you're not getting good contact. If your plate is not the same temperature as it was last time, so say you've quenched plate number seven, the first one, the plate was relatively cool, the last one, the plate was relatively warm, that's gonna change a little bit within how much hardness you're achieving. Um, and also, from my understanding, the amount of pressure that you put on those plates, so in so doing, creating contact. Um, so it's, it's a positive pressure, positive pressure quench is what it is. So make sure that you put the same amount of pressure. If you put five pounds on one, it's not going to quench the same as the one that you put 300 pounds on. Well, you can shut up. So, um, consistency. That's really what all of this comes down to. If you are not consistent in your heat treat, you will not get consistent results. And this actually, actually opens up a whole other conversation regarding steels. Um, and just just eyeballed me like sideways eyes, like don't start on this rant now, but I'm gonna give you a five minute rant on it. Um, pick a steel, use that steel, understand that steel, and when you truly know that steel, and I'd probably say that would be after making a couple of hundred components out of that particular steel and testing them, not just going, hey, send them out into the universe, but actually testing them or having people test them for you to see if they're producing the results that you expect, then try a different steel. Also, get yourself a ledger. Write in a ledger what you're doing with those steels. Mark the, let's call them knives for want of a better object, Mark your knife saying, okay, this knife is knife number three, and I quench that one at 1550 in canola oil, and the oil temperature was 57 degrees, and I tempered it at 325 for two hours, and then 300 for two hours, all right? You know what that is. It's a quantifiable thing. If it chips, you know that you need to adjust something. So do you need to adjust your temper, increase it a little bit, or do you need to um, change your quench medium? Great. Then do basically do the same thing with another steel and you, you know, get to learn four, five, six steels. Great, awesome. And you'll find different steels that you find desirable for different functions. If you are using mystery meat and junkyard steel, you don't necessarily know what you have. You have a good guesstimation. You know that I have yay much of leaf spring and it should be 5160. It might not be 5160, but it's plausible it was because uh, it came from a 1975 Chevy K10, right? So you know more or less it should be this thing. As you work down the blade uh, or down the spring, you get consistent results until one day one of them just breaks slap in the middle. You know, why the heck did that one break? Well, the problem is that you don't know because that wasn't virgin steel. You don't know whether that thing had a microfracture in it beforehand or whether you yourself during your forging process did that 
to the piece of steel, or even in your heat treat process, you did that to your piece of steel. So I'm not saying that it's wrong to use um, junkyard steel or, or acquisition steel, but be careful. It will do weird things as an anomaly. You think it's one thing, it's something else. It's got a micro fracture in it, it fails. Um, I certainly wouldn't give a piece like that to a client, but for tinkering, it's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but also you can go to very reputable steel manufacturers and wholesalers and get something like 5160 or some um, 1095 or something like that for a relatively decent price. Um, one of the suppliers that we get steel from, I can get a 20 foot stick of 5160 quarter by one and a half for sub a hundred bucks. Man, that's a lot of knives. If you're using six inches of steel per knife, that's, that's a lot of knife. So uh, you're looking at 40 some odd. Yeah, like 44 or something. Anyway, uh, enough about that rant. But know your materials, know what they do, know how to get them to behave at the best that you can get them to behave. And then you might be able to make a product that is actually worthy of your mark. So there's a thought. Enjoy. <laughs>